And we are recording. And um, hi, everyone. I'm really excited for uh, my guest um, interview today, Steph Lebsack, who is a uh, um, she's a speech language pathologist. She is a um, professor or, or um, teacher at a university. Um, I'm not sure. Um, like, like everyone has like a different like um, long uh, long thing you're supposed to call them. So so I'm not actually sure what you're. Uh, what, what, what your official title is, but but uh, I, I, I'm going to call you professor at a university, and um, and and also you're one of the um, co-organizers or or on the on the board of the Joint World Congress for Stuttering and Cluttering, and I and I think I got most of that right, mm -hmm. and, um, and 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 also and also you you stutter uh, with uh, um, a kind of um, kind of unique stutter, st so. Um, so, so I want to talk about that too. Um, can, um, can you give an introduction um, of yourself? Yeah, sure. Yep. Um, so thank you for having me on. I'm honored to be on your um, show here. I'm Steph Lubsack, as you said, and yes, I'm a professor at Baylor University for their online grad program. I've practiced as an SLP for 12 years. Um, I um, live in Aurora, Colorado, United States. Um, I have a husband, Kevin, um, and two kids, Mary and Carter, a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. So our house is never quiet because we also have a pug and two cats. <laughs> um, so we're always going. And um, I also have a new private practice, um, Lebsack Speech Therapy that I do telehealth with. So um, when I'm not teaching or um, working on the new textbook that I'm writing, so I'm doing that too, um, I am doing private telepractice and or playing with children. So it's always a busy time, <laughs> which, is, which is good. Cool, um, cool. And um, can you um, can you talk about how you got into speech therapy? Absolutely, I can. I love I love this story. So um, I knew I wanted to be a speech pathologist at um, a pretty early age. And um, you'll have to excuse my my voice; it's a little bit weak today, so I apologize. Um, I got into speech pathology at. Um, or I knew I wanted to at an early age. Um, I have a brother who is a person who stutters and he um, started stuttering, I believe around the age of six. Um, and growing up witnessing him stutter, um, I knew I wanted to help people like him and advocate for people like him, um, he never had speech therapy growing up. I don't think he ever wanted it. And he still um, has never had speech therapy. Um, even with me being a speech pathologist, I never practiced anything on him. I never forced it on him. He never wanted it. Cool beans. You know, we were good with that. But um, I think seeing my parents specifically, um, our dad um, in the way he reacted, he meant really well, I think. I don't think um, he, he meant poorly from this, however, but um, mainly seeing the way our dad talked about it behind his back and I witnessed some of that, um, you know, the concern for his stuttering, um, and oh, he's stuttering a lot more now, um, the frequency with which he was stuttering. Um, now I'm so passionate about stuttering that I kind of go into like a mama bear mode because of my brother, <laughs> you know, he, he's kind of my person. And so um, I think growing up with him, I'm so passionate about it um, that before I started um, to stutter, um, I, uh, <laughs> I actually had someone who stutters mm -hmm. tell me, Steph, you're too passionate about stuttering. And I thought, well, what's that supposed to mean? You stutter and I don't, you know, what's that supposed to mean? But I think it's just because I, I go into this like 
defensive mama bear mode because of my brother, you know, that I need to advocate, you know, um, for that, you know, um, but that's, that's why is, is because of, because of him, he's, he's like my person. And so, um, he's a lovely, his name is Jasper. He's a lovely person. And if you haven't met him yet, you will, if you are around me or you'll hear about him, cause I like to talk about him. <laughs> So, that's yeah. really, really, uh, that's really, really cool. So, um, so, so you're pretty young when you decided you wanted to be a, a speech um, pathologist. Um, how, um, and actually, I, um, I never, I never heard about speech pathology until college. So, so, so I think in high school, like, uh, um, it wouldn't have, um, it wouldn't have, like, um, I, I wouldn't have ever connected the dots. Oh, well, um, I I can go and study and help people with uh, with with a speech problem. So um, so 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 what was the thing? Uh, what was the thing that like connected and and you realized? Oh yeah, I want to I want to study like this, but like going from I want to help people to I want to study speech pathology. That's a really good question. So I was a Girl Scout growing up, like brownies all the way up, mm -hmm. and. Um, I did this thing called a wider opportunity, a wider op. And a wider op is where you can apply to take a, um, like a trip. And lots of girls applied and I had to write an essay and get interviewed. It was like this intensive process and only 50 girls got selected for this, um, opportunity and I got picked to go and the opportunity was called careers in therapy and I was a sophomore in high school and I got to go to Scranton Pennsylvania and I got to go to a university there and stay with a host family and go on this um, to Marywood College to this university and stay on campus in a dorm and I got to do clinical rounds and observe. And I got to observe PT, OT, music therapy, speech therapy, et cetera. Um, and so I got to see even beyond stuttering what speech pathologists do. And I got to see what kind of courses they have to take and I got to see. And so for me, that really solidified, you know, in elementary school, I did learn that speech pathology exists because there were kids that got pulled out for speech therapy. You know, the speech therapist is here, all the speech kids need to go. So I knew that it existed and somebody helps with that. But it was that wider op trip that I really solidified my answer of, yes, I wanna do this. Um, my dad was a physical therapist and so he knew of speech therapy um, and so when I came home I said dad this is what I want to do and of course he was really excited because it's in the therapy realm you know I work with PTs all the time or I did um, work with PTs all the time um, and so um, that trip really did it for me because I got to see the hospital side of it and the geriatric and the rehab and the, you know, the other side of what we do, because despite that I specialize in stuttering, um, my second love is medical. I'm, I'm largely a medical speech pathologist and I've worked in hospitals the majority of my career. So, um, uh, yeah, so that was a really great trip and really taught me a lot. So what's a um, so what's a medical speech pathologist? I'm not I'm I'm not familiar with that term. Yeah, so we work a lot with stroke patients, um, traumatic brain injury patients. Um, a hospital speech pathologist uh, works with swallowing disorders a lot. Um, so, um, and a lot of people don't know that we do that, but we test swallowing, you know, um, just like your arms or your legs can weaken, your swallowing reflex can weaken, and people, you know, those are muscles too, and um, can weaken, and you can start aspirating or having, you know, liquid or foods go the wrong way. Um, and we can do therapy to help strengthen that process. 
Um, you know, and if people are aspirating or having liquids, you know, repetitively go the wrong way, you can get a specific kind of pneumonia called aspiration pneumonia. So that's something that we, of course, want to try to prevent or, you know, but of course it's up to the, it's up to the patient, you know, um, you know, not everybody who is, you know, and this is just one example because I've had dysphagia before. It's called dysphagia. That's what it's called when you have a swallowing difficulty. It's called dysphagia. Um, I've had dysphagia from my breathing troubles, you know, so it's not just elderly people who get dysphagia or swallowing trouble, but, um, you know, so, so in the hospital setting, we do a lot of swallowing evaluations at the bedside. Um, we do a lot of cognitive evaluations, you know, I've even had, um, shoot, this is an interesting situation, but I've even had, um, a crime scene, you know, uh, I've had to do a cognitive evaluation on, on a, a crime scene, you know, someone is shot and, and all these happen and, and they're pleading insanity or something. And, and the police officer is sitting outside the hospital room and, and waiting on me and, 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 and they say, is this person cognitively able to go to court and speak for themselves, you know, and I have to do a cognitive evaluation and make sure I have legal release to speak to so-and-so to, to say, um, how did they do on their cognitive assessment or if I can even legally speak to them or not at that point, it depends. Um, yeah, so there's a lot, you know, um, a traumatic brain injuries, you know, um, living in Colorado, it's ski season, you know, you, you see a lot of injuries and sometimes head injuries if people aren't wearing helmets, et cetera. Um, so we work with that. We work with voice, um, you know, difficulties. We work with, um, you know, and then we work with little kids on their R's and S's, their pronunciation. Um, you know, we do that too. And, and I know a lot of people are familiar with that part of it. You know, if I were to ask someone on the street, what is a speech pathologists do, or more commonly people know as probably a speech therapist. So what does a speech therapist do? They probably say, oh, I had a friend that went to speech therapy for their S's or a lisp. You know, you'd probably hear that more commonly, but every so often you'll get someone that says, oh, my grandmother had a stroke and went to speech therapy uh, for her memory or for her language, you know. Um, so there's an other side to what we do. Yeah, that's uh, that, um, that's interesting. I I I met a guy and he um, he's a speech uh, pathologist and so um, so I, I I was really excited. I was like, oh hey, I I I have cluttering. Let's uh, let, let's talk about it. And he's like, oh oh, actually actually like for the last four years, I've done nothing but like swallowing. Um, so um so, so so I'm familiar with that part of speech pathology, but uh, but I thought oh, that was really like fascinating that uh, that, uh, that like like he. He spent just so much of his time um, dedicated to swallowing, which uh, uh, which is something that uh, which is something that I think people don't don't realize um, can be a really really big big part of speech pathology. Yeah, there's a specialty in it too. In fact, um, I could probably almost specialize in fluency and swallowing because um, I've done so much of it. Um, there's actually. Um, you can do swallow studies. These are one of my favorite things to do in the x-ray unit, um, radiology unit. You know, you gear up and you have a radiologist there and you feed them and you watch live time on the x-ray, you know, radiology machine, watch them swallow. It's one of my favorite things to do. And you read it to see where it goes, right, with the anatomy. Um, you can also scope somebody up their nose and down to look, you put a camera up their nose and down and you feed them something and you watch where it goes, watch what they're doing. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's really fun. Yeah. And, and I have a, uh, I have a kind of question with that. Um, it's, it's kind of a long question. Um, lots of my, uh, lots of my questions are. So, yeah. so the way I, the way I naturally say my L's is, is wrong um, because um, you know how you're supposed to, um, you know how you're, when you say L, you're supposed to connect your tongue with the top of your, um, so, um, so, so the way that um, the way that I sell, say my L's is without like actually connecting my tongue to the top of my um, mouth, um, and and um, somebody somebody said that there's a term for that. I'm I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that or if it's 
Um, but um, but so so basically uh, basically like I'm I, I'm saying I'm saying L, but I'm saying it wrong. Um, and so, and so I'm wondering if, if swallowing is like that too, like, um, like, like, are there, uh, like, like, there's probably like 5% of people that say, say their L's wrong, like I do, um, or, or like, like wrong in air quotes, um, like I do. Um, and, and so, so I'm wondering is, is it the same with swallowing? Like, like people can be swallowing wrong or, or like, like wrong, um, and, and like through their, through, through their whole life and, and not really realizing that, oh, well, everyone else swallows like a different way than you do. Yeah, so there is, that's a really good question. So there are um, ways, just as you said, to um, uh, physiologically or with your, we call these the muscles of articulation. Um, and so there is a way to place your tongue in the wrong place. And we call it, you approximate, you know, you approximate the sound or you put your tongue in the wrong place, but it sounds correct. So like, if you told me your tongue was in the wrong place, I wouldn't have known that unless I was like looking at your mouth the whole time you're speaking this whole time. Um, cause your L sounds fine when you're speaking. Right. So I wouldn't have even noticed cause it sounds, sounds good. Right. Um, and so when you're swallowing, um, there are ways to still swallow something, but yes, do, something improperly or approximate it, so to speak, right? Um, for example, I'm one of those. So I'll use myself as an example. Um, I'm what we call a tongue thruster. Um, and so what that is, so there's stages of the swallow, right? You, there's three main stages and within the first stage that we break it up into two and I'm gonna spare you cause it would take up some time for me to explain them. But basically, you put something in your mouth, you move it from front to back, okay? And then once you move it to the back of your tongue, then your swallow triggers, that starts the second stage, all right? And then once the swallow triggers, then it moves down and it has to clear um, down into your, um, um, it, it goes into your, um, Oh my gosh, my words this morning. So we have this sphincter called your upper um, esophageal sphincter and it goes into your third phase, which is your um, esophagus, okay? You don't wanna go in into your trachea and your windpipe, that's the wrong way. Yes, there is a right way and a wrong way, okay? You want it to go into your um, uh, esophagus, okay? And down, down into your stomach, okay? So there's three phases. There's basically for lack of a better term, okay? Um, we call them oral, of oral phase, pharyngeal phase, and esophageal phase. But basically, I'm going to say mouth, throat, and esophagus. Okay, so mouth, front to back, throat, swallow triggers, and then it goes down esophagus. Okay, so the mouth part is was I what I wasn't doing quite correctly, and so when I took a drink you should make a good seal with your tongue. So when you said L, this is right what I thought of. My tongue wasn't going to the top of the mouth and creating a good seal with what I had in there, right? Because you have to gather like the food and we call it a bolus, but you gather it together mm -hmm. and you have to get it kind of gathered together to swallow. Because if it was everywhere, then it would be quite messy and getting everywhere and falling out and all kinds of stuff. And it would be kind of hard to swallow if it were up here in your mouth, right? Like if it's anterior and in the front of your mouth, then you can't quite swallow it towards the back either, right? If you're just kind of thinking about it. And so um, you have to gather it into kind of a little, lack of a better term, ball or, you know, thing and you gather it together and you kind of make a seal to the top of your palate here. And you do that with your tongue and kind of put it on the top and then you swallow it back, okay? Well, I wasn't doing that quite right. And I was called a tongue thrust. So when I wasn't swallowing correctly, so to speak, um, I was bringing my tongue forward. And so, when I went to collect that bolus or collect my food like this, I went to swallow and my tongue went like that forward. 
And so I was constantly stabbing myself. Like when I had chips and salsa with friends, I would constantly stab myself in the palate with a piece of chip because like my tongue would go for it. So I was like, ah, it would bleed. Like it was not fun. And like, I wondered why I always did that. And they're like, you're a tongue thruster. So I actually had to have speech therapy when I was in the speech therapy program for my tongue thrust to learn how to swallow properly. Yeah. So I had to learn how to make this seal because what would happen was they told me to drink, take a drink of water and they said, okay. And I swallowed it and they're like, you cheated. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, okay, we want to see you take a drink of water, but now open your mouth and swallow it. <laughs> and so I did that but my tongue came forward and water went all over the table, like all over the table, because instead of creating that seal, I went forward and it went all over the table in front of the clinician. Yep. So that seems, uh, that seems like, uh, that seems like something that would be really um, hard to do anyway, to like take a drink of water and swallow it with, with your, with, with your mouth open is, is that really something that most people can easily do? You should be able to once you have um, got it kind of together and in that seal to your palate. Mm -hmm. If you're swallowing correctly and your tongue is where it's supposed to be when you're about to swallow and it's kind of in the middle, middle to back, you should be able to open your mouth and swallow without it coming out. Huh. That's yeah. uh, that's really uh, that's really interesting. And and I have a um, I have another um, I have another question. It's um, mm -hmm. it's actually a question I've had for over twenty years, and yeah. and, and it's only uh, it's only very very mildly related. <clears throat> um, but uh, but but you're you're probably the first person that um, has a chance of of actually being able to answer this. Okay. Um, so. So, um, so, so a friend of mine um, back um, back um, back when we were all like like um, teenager um, teenagers just uh, doing like goofy um, goofy stuff. What uh, what um, he he had this like ability. Um, you, you know, like um, um, young um, young boys are always like trying to like out out like gross each other or, or uh, um, gro um, gross out each other. So 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 his ability was that he could like kind of half halfway swallow a, a piece of spaghetti. Uh, and then like, um, and then have it like come out his nose, and then he would um, kind of like go back and forth, um, and and so many people, so many people said to him, "Hey, hey, that's uh, uh, that, that's really bad. You're gonna like permanently injure yourself." Um, and so, um, and so, and so, my question is, um, were were they right? Like, is that actually bad for you, or? Um, so, no, I mean, he, so what he was doing, I can tell you what he was doing. And no, I mean, I pass, I've passed a camera scope up and down. Um, so what happens is in the way our anatomy works is you have this flap back here. So, okay, you know, when a cartoon yells, Okay, a cartoon mm -hmm. character. And he goes, ah, and there's that little hangy down thing where he's going, ah, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Ah, that's called the uvula. Okay. Ah, and that uvula is connected way back here, right? Ah, the part that it's connected to is called the soft palate. And that soft palate, like this roof of your mouth is all connected, okay? And that's what separates like our oral cavity from our nasal cavity, okay? Uh, if we took this out, then we would have just this huge space, okay? That's why kids that have like cleft palates have just this huge hole and they're super hypernasal. Have you ever met a kid with a cleft palate? Um, I don't. Uh, well, I've, I've I've seen some kids, but I, but like I know yeah. a lot of people. Um, I know a lot, of, a lot of adults who had cleft palates, but then got surgery. Or have you heard them speak? Maybe, and it's a little nasally. Maybe. 
even after surgery, a little nasally, that's, that's why. So this part, if you were to follow your finger, you'll probably make yourself gag. But if you're following your finger, it connects all the way back, right? And it gets softer. It does. It's hard here. We call it the hard palate. And there's some ridges, okay? And you need to go back and it gets softer. Okay, that's the soft palate or the velum. Mm -hmm. And you have that hangy down thing called the uvula. Okay, so that's the area I'm talking about. That soft palate, its job when we swallow is to move up and cover the space that's back here mm -hmm. and block the space between I almost said nasopharynx but block the space basically between your nasal cavity and your oropharyngeal or mouth and throat cavities okay so when you're swallowing when that happens is remember I told you, you put something in your mouth it moves from the front to the back and then your swallow triggers when your swallow triggers that's when that happens okay so what he was doing he wasn't really swallowing it he wasn't swallowing at all he was just sitting there and he was sticking it up and through because his velum or soft palate wasn't up blocking it Mm -hmm. He was just sticking it through. He wasn't really hurting anything. It probably was just uncomfortable for him and looked kind of cool or <laughs> gross or whatever, right? Because I can yeah. pass a camera through there pretty safely. It's just uncomfortable, right? And for mm -hmm. some people, it might hurt. Like if you have sinus issues, it's going to kind of feel a feeling of pain, um, and if it's kind of narrow, it might feel like it hurts a little bit. Um, but that's what he was doing because his soft palate hadn't lifted. Have mm -hmm. you ever been drinking like soda pop or something and you're drinking it and you're hanging out with friends and you laugh at something funny and soda pop comes out of your nose? Have you ever had that happen? Yeah, I think um, I think like once when I was uh, when I was really, really young. It's because you didn't let your soft palate coordinate. It was still down. You didn't complete the swallow process. You laughed and it came out of your nose because it incoordinated. You're like the ha 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 <laughs> because it was opened and it burns, doesn't it? It doesn't feel good. Yeah, it doesn't feel good when that happens because you didn't let your soft palate coordinate and come up to protect your nasal cavity. So that stuff doesn't come out right? People who have had their uvula removed for different reasons. Mm -hmm. All right. When you look in a textbook, that uvula, ah, the thing when they yell in a textbook, it says the function of the uvula is to raise and lower the uvula. Well, I beg to differ because patients who have, I have had, who have had it removed for different reasons, they have coffee come out their nose every so often. <laughs> So it does have a function, in my opinion, in raising that soft palate. It contributes because patients have incoordination and have stuff come out their nose. See, now you know some about swallowing. Uh, yeah, and that's um, and that's really interesting. I uh, that, uh, that's really cool that you were able to answer one of my uh, long uh, long standing um, questions mm -hmm. that I uh, and, and yeah, it's actually it's actually longer than twenty. Um, it's actually longer than twenty years ago. It might, might be like. Uh, might be like almost 30 years ago that I've had that. Absolutely, um, no problem. That, uh, that question, so that's pretty cool. So, um, so, 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 I want to go. I want to go, uh, go forward, um, forward in time to, um, to, to when you, um, to when, to when you started stuttering. Um, can you, um, can you talk about, um, can you talk about that? I can. Yeah. So, um, I was 37. I'm 37 now. Um, I have lung disease and it's a degenerative process. My um, diaphragm is almost paralyzed, hence my voice quality. Um, and I, um, so over time it's gotten um, worse. And it's something that I 
I was a 27 week preemie and I was born in the eighties, um, pre surfactant, um, which is something that they are able to give premature babies now to help their lungs develop. So babies born now as premature as I was, they won't go through this, but I have a condition called bronchopulmonary dysplasia that I've had since I was a baby that um, I've always had, but you could almost say it was in remission, I guess, um, for some time. And they're finding in some cases that it comes back in adulthood, almost like COPD, um, but it's different. Um, and it's what's caused my diaphragm to degenerate and function and caused a bunch of issues. So, um, so that's a little bit of a snippet of this pre-story. So I had a, an occurrence where um, I have severe asthma to boot. And so I had a really severe asthma attack. I'm in the hospital. They moved me down to ICU. Um, medications aren't working and I stopped breathing. So I had to be resuscitated and I, I remember it actually, <laughs> I remember what it felt like to stop breathing. It was insane. Um, but I don't know how long it took them to resuscitate me. I, I don't know that answer. And I don't know how long I went without oxygen to my brain, but all I know is I woke up on a ventilator like two days later. So in the ICU. And so um, at some point, like they resuscitated me and put me on a ventilator. I knew they were going to put me on a ventilator because I remember them telling me they were going to do it. But um I just knew there was a bunch of people in the room, this guy on top of me, they're bagging me. And then I woke up on a vent anyways. Um, so that was just this major traumatic experience and I lost oxygen to my brain and I woke up brain injured. Basically. Um, I woke up legally blind. Um, I woke up with the short-term memory of about an hour to two hours. So like I would see somebody and they would tell me something and I would forget it pretty quickly. Um, I was teaching two sections of my class and both of my sections had to be handed over to other faculty. Um, because of it, um, I was constantly forgetting where I was and why I was there and it was insane. Um, I was started having seizures um, and then I started to stutter. So it was a neurogenic stutter caused by the brain injury. Sorry, that was a long story. <laughs> oh, no, that's, uh, that's, that's interesting background. And, and um, you, uh, I listened to part of your uh, podcast with Daniela uh, Rossi and um, and your, uh, your, your stuttering was much more um, pronounced, um, pronounced there than, uh, than here. Um, so, uh, so, so can you kind of talk, um, can, can you kind of talk about that um, too? Yeah, so um, I did that podcast, it's called Changing the Status Quo is the episode, and um, I was on it with Jean-Francois LeBlanc from Quebec. Um, Canada. He's also on the um, organizing team of the JWCSC or the Joint World Congress of Stuttering Cluttering. Yes, you said it perfectly. It's got a long name. Um, and that was our first media um, contact for the Congress. And um, I was still in the hospital when I did that podcast. I they were like, let's reschedule, let's reschedule. And I said, no, <laughs> I'm too stubborn. I, I'm in the hospital a lot and I work from the hospital a lot. I've taught my graduate class probably more than 20 times from a hospital bed on Zoom with oxygen and machines and stuff. Um, I just, I just keep going. Um, I'm too stubborn to stop. Um, and <laughs> Um, I was probably 
three or four days off the vent when I did that recording. Um, and so it was very, very prominent then. Um, very prominent then as I have rehabilitated and improved my cognitive deficits are very, very mild now. Um, I haven't had a seizure in quite some time. Um, my vision is much improved. I still don't have any, well, I have peripheral vision. It's improving, but it's not fully back. I can see colors now, like I'm not legally blind. I still have to wear two different pairs of glasses, but I have been cleared to start to, um, like I'm starting this driving program and like things are happening. And so with that recovery, I found that the stuttering prominence has also significantly decreased. Um, and so I stutter when I'm very tired. And I stutter when I'm very, very anxious. So if I, if my brain gets overstimulated, um, like for example, um, multitasking is very hard for me now. Like I can't read and comprehend something while my kids are saying, mommy, can you do this? And mommy, this, that, the other, um, I'll say, can you guys wait just a minute? Like, I'll forget everything I just read and I'll lose my spot. And what was I just doing? Um, it's a whole new world. Like I used to be able to keep everything right here in my head and now I can't. Um, and so when my brain gets overstimulated, I get a headache, I get nauseous and I stutter. Um, and so it, it's really interesting. Um, and so I've seen a decrease in the prominence over time um, since July. July 4th was the day I got off of the vent. Um, and so since then, um, I've, I've seen it decrease over time. Um, yeah, so... Uh, and that's interesting. And, and I'm, I'm wondering what's your, what, what your like initial reaction was to that you, uh, that, that you were stuttering because, uh, be, because most, um, well, well, pretty much everyone that I know with, um, with, with stuttering, like, like even, um, even people that, that now have come to terms with it and, um, like, like they went, um, they went through a phase where they were just very, very frustrated um, angry, uh, uh, like just just a lot of emotions about, hey, well, um, why uh, why is this happening to me? Um, and, and I think that um, you're in kind of a unique a unique position because you've always been a, you've always been an advocate for for stuttering. Um, you, um, you mentioned um, you mentioned um, before that you uh, were, were even going to stuttering um, stuttering groups before, uh, and I want to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but um, before your before your injury. So, um, so, so I'm wondering if, if you woke up and you were like, oh, cool, um, I, um, I, I can stutter now, or, um, or if you, um, or if you felt a lot of that same frustration, like, oh, well, how come I can't, um, how come I can't pronounce um, stuff that I want, to, how, how come I can't say the stuff that I want to say? Um, so, um, so, 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 so I think you have, um, you, you probably have just a really, really interesting, like unique perspective on just all, all the emotions that you probably were probably feeling um, when you realized, oh, hey, my, my speech is a little bit messed up too. Um, it was really, really interesting because even within a week of being a person who stutters, um, I had somebody say they thought it was fake. Um, I got interrupted quite a lot and actually, my opinion on that formed very quickly that I don't mind getting interrupted. Um, and the reason why, and my view on that was, it is very different. Um, when my stuttering was more prominent, um, when I blocked really hard, it was physically very painful for me from a lung standpoint. Um, I was out of breath 
two seconds prior. Like I was already out of breath. And so being stuck like that was very, very painful. And so when someone would interrupt me and say the word, I was like, thank God, like, cause I'm hurting. Um, and so my reason for not minding interrupting is completely different. Um, and my, my reason for being frustrated is completely different because I didn't mind the stuttering. Um, it's not, oop, I need to plug in my computer. It's not something that bothered me um, because of the stuttering itself. Um, I was okay with that from the get-go because I, I was kind of desensitized to it from a young age you know, I, I'm okay with stuttering. It, it's all right. Um, I wasn't embarrassed to stutter in front of people. Um, for me, the frustration was this hurts. <laughs> this hurts my lungs and I'm hurting when I stutter physically um, because of my lung disease. That was the hard part. And so it was a little bit of a different reason um, and so I went silent for a little while because of not because, so like when you talk about avoidance behaviors and covert stuttering, my reason was not shame or fear. My reason was pain, physical pain because of lung disease was stuttering. My avoidance was a completely different reason. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that, uh, that's interesting. So so have you met, yeah. have you met other people, um, have you met other people who stutter who also, um, who, who also have, it's, it's kind of physically hard for them to speak and so, so they also don't mind being interrupted because that's, uh, that, uh, that's, that's something that I didn't expect to hear today is that someone with stuttering um, likes, likes being interrupted. Yeah, uh, um, I haven't, um, and I'd love to. Surely there's somebody out there that it hurts to block because of a, you know, maybe someone who has COPD that feels that way or maybe someone, but literally it's a chapter to add to the covert section of a textbook, you know, because it's another it's another option for avoidance, you know, and I didn't know it until I experienced it, um, you know, and I didn't mind getting interrupted because it was a relief because I could stop trying because it hurt to try like pretty badly. Huh, and that's, um, that's, that, that's interesting. So, so with um, with with me, I didn't realize that there were problems with my um, speech until uh, until I was in my late like mid to late twenties, uh -huh. and um, and so and so back um, back when my speech was really bad, um, I um, or 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 it was more that um, it was more that I didn't really talk. Um, I um, I think I had like a lot of the same stuff. Um, speech wasn't actually like physically painful for me, but I remember it just being a really painful experience. So so uh, so, but 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 that was uh, that was in a time when I didn't have any vocabulary or or, or understanding. So um, so so I just have like um, I. I can't really describe it now. It was just uh, um, just when you were describing that, it just gave me a kind of like flashback to the um, to the past of me like um, me, uh, me like kind of trying to talk, but there uh, but there was something wrong. But I didn't even know there was something wrong. So um, so so, yeah. so 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 anyway, um, I'm I'm probably not making any sense at all. No, but, that makes but, sense. But, but what you're saying is really interesting. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That no, that makes sense. I'm following. <laughs> Oh, and um, and could um, since um, you, um, you, you, you mentioned that you um, that, that, that you teach about um, stuttering 
um, stuttering versus cluttering. And then, and, and then one of the things that you, th that you told me is that some students um, are kind of, uh, um, some speech pathology students are kind of really nervous about, oh, well, how can I know if it's stuttering versus how can I know if it's cluttering? Uh, I, I think you called it differential diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, can, um, can, you, uh, can, can you talk about that? And then for someone that doesn't really know much about stuttering or cluttering, can you describe, uh, um, describe, um, de describe what, it, what both of them are and what, um, what's, what, what's, what's different and what's the same? I can, absolutely. Yeah, so um, students oftentimes look at stuttering, cluttering and think, what's the difference? There's, there can be repetitions associated with both. There can be, um, you know, uh, rate of speech changes associated with both. Um, and stuttering and cluttering is something even myself when I finished my grad class that I thought, can I tell the difference, you know? Um, and I actually do show video examples of somebody who clutters and multiple of people who stutters to show, to show the difference and they can see and say, okay, you know, because once you see something, it really, really helps somebody to, to see the difference, but also hear somebody speak about their experiences of stuttering versus cluttering and the difference there. But there are some parallels as well um, with the experience. And, and so with differential diagnosis with stuttering and cluttering, um, what I really teach students is that cluttering should really be at, at the root of it should really be classified as like a language entity versus a, and again, this, we're still calling it this, this is what we still use the term or the classification as, I don't like it per se, but we still call it a fluency right? Stuttering and cluttering goes under the, the category of fluency. Um, my class that I teach is still called fluency disorders. I don't like that. I, I refer to it as stuttering and cluttering. That's what I call it. I say, I teach the stuttering and cluttering class at Baylor. I don't, I don't call it fluency disorders because um, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it being called that. Um, but um, some differences in differential diagnosis that I teach students um, with stuttering and cluttering is that cluttering um, oftentimes, not always, but can come with things like um, topic maintenance differences. Um, there are some even grammatical differences at times where sections of statements are left off. Um, yes, there can be quick rate of speech, but within that parts can be left out. Um, stuttering isn't quite the same in that regard. Um, and so we see some language differences in cluttering that we don't see in stuttering. And that's where the biggest difference lies is that, and, and where you get your differential diagnosis mainly is those linguistic differences. Um, now, cluttering brings about disfluencies oftentimes, and, and sometimes those disfluencies aren't as obvious. There's an example that I give in class where students say, well, wait a minute, that person clutters, I don't hear a lot of disfluencies. And that's when I teach students that we're still treating a human being, number one. And that's what I teach my students from the get-go in that class. I tell my students, this is a human being sitting in front of you, <laughs> not a piece of paper that you read subject is a 35 year old male that right like and and that's what students get in their mind is that okay this person 
no, 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 the piece of paper isn't the person. The person is who's sitting in front of you, right? That's what we have to get straight very first off, okay? Don't be intimidated by the person sitting in front of you because they're just like a, a person just like you are, all right? Get on their level, okay? I teach my students that the people they're serving is they're equal, right? My students are my equal. The people I serve are my equal, no matter what. And so that really helps them to feel better going into differential diagnosis from the get-go, I think, um, because they're just talking to a person, right? Like if they look at this piece of paper and read this case history about somebody, they're already starting to get intimidated. And I'm like, yeah, look at that piece of paper, but wait till you talk to the person first, right? Like talk to the person first and see what they have to say about their life. Don't just rely on this piece of paper and think you can diagnose them, <laughs> right? Talk to the person first. Um, anyways, but, but the language, go back, going back to your question, the language is the big, the big thing because we don't, we don't see that now. Now, language, language entities can happen with stuttering. But they aren't directly related like they are with cluttering. So that's, that's the biggest difference in differential diagnosis. Um, and sometimes um, there are people who stutter and clutter. And also um, we are seeing new disfluencies in children. Um, and this is taking a step further in, with autism, right? There's, we're looking at children with autism who have disfluencies that don't exactly, you know, look like stuttering and they don't quite look like cluttering. And I have students that come to me in their practicums and they say, well, what do I label it as? And my answer to student, those students are, does the label really matter? <laughs> call it what you call it and then treat what you're treating. You know, what is the person's goals? Okay, cool, go with it, <laughs> right? Like, that's what I tell them, <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah, anyways. I could, I could soapbox that all day, but, but if that helps answer your question, um, there are some, you know, differences between stuttering and cluttering that as a clinician, if we are taxed with differential diagnosis that we know between stuttering and cluttering that can help us out. And it doesn't mean that a person who clutters is going to show all of those things either, um, or a person who stutters is going to show all of those things, but, you know, and it's not just those things either. You know, we look at so much else. I mean, it's all individualized and we look at emotions. We look at all these other things, right? Um, when we diagnose, we have to do a very thorough evaluation, but um, there are certain things we know about cluttering or certain things we know about stuttering that can set them apart from each other um, a little bit. Uh, that's, um, that's really, um, that's really interesting, and then, um, and then especially from my um, especially from my perspective, because I uh, well, I'm really fascinated with stuttering. Um, mm -hmm. I just I, I just think it's really really fascinating to learn to learn about. But then, but then like like my experience, um, like like I, I I don't have the I don't have the same experience as someone who stutters at, at all, and so mm -hmm. um, and so um, so. So, so it's more, um, it's more like uh, when I'm learning about stuttering, it's more like, um, it's more like when I talk to a friend who's really excited about cars, like, like it's a really cool concept, but I'm, I'm, I'm not really a car person at all. And so, so, so it's really, really interesting to learn about the process of them, them being, being really into cars, but, but, but it's something that I just personally don't relate to. Um, and so, um, and so that's, um, that, um, uh, that's kind of, um, uh, that's kind of like, like my experience is that like, like I'm over here and then the folks, um, the folks, the folks with stuttering is over here. And so it's really interesting to hear from your perspective where, um, and then, um, and then your students pers perspective where like, we're all, uh, we're, we're all kind of indistinguishable, um, until you can figure out what to, um, what, uh, what, what to really look for. 
Yeah. And I think too, that it, you know, in talking to you, like if you were to talk to somebody who's a new clinician or a graduate student clinician, I think that they would quickly realize that you don't stutter just, you know what I mean? Like in your experiences, um, you know, when you share with them. And so I think that's why I also say talk to the person because, um, that also helps with differential diagnosis so much that, um, you know, beyond, beyond the overt characteristics of what's happening with speech, right? Like mm-hmm. beyond, because, you know, yes, you can hear phrase repetitions and yes, you can hear, you know, different types of repetitions, but like you just said, your experience is so much different from stuttering. And I think once you, if you were to describe your experience to a clinician, then they would probably quickly realize, okay, yeah, your experience isn't like stuttering. Your experience is more like, right? And so it's so much beyond data. Like, and, and, and I teach that too, that like, I think, you know, a lot of clinicians get really, really hung up on data. Like I could take a sample of your speech, for example, and I could count and I could tally and I could say, okay, you had this many, this, and this many, this, and this many, this, but what, what does that do? You know, what does that tell me about your life? What does that tell me about what you want to accomplish? Right? Nothing (laughs) that doesn't tell me about what you want. And so you know, there's so much further, deeper conversation that has to be done in the evaluation that matters more, right? I mean, do we have to take data? Sure. But there's so much more beyond that. And uh, yeah, oh my gosh, I could get on a soapbox. But yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, differential diagnosis isn't just, you know, speech patterns and what's going on with that it's it's so much more so much more (laughs) yeah yeah you make a good point yeah um yeah and it's um it's interesting that um so 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 one of the uh well you mentioned um you you mentioned that um that, that you keep reminding people we're um we're still treating a human a human being and um and and actually that's that's one of the reasons why I started my series on on cluttering and um, and, and 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 started doing interviews with uh, like speech related interviews, is that um, and it is that a lot of the stuff that's available written by a speech uh, written by speech pathologists is just really depressing from a uh, uh, from a like regular person's perspective and. Um, and actually, like, um, so, 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 so the cool thing about the cool thing about stuttering is lots and lots of people have written books on on stuttering, and so, and, and so, like, if you Google stuttering, then, um, the, um, then, then you get a lot of like real people that have written books, but, but if you Google cluttering, uh, and, and, um, and actually, Rutger Wilhelm's book that he just published a few months ago, um, is the first like actual like book about cluttering that's kind of not depressing like uh, like there are lots of really good books on cluttering but uh, w- w- well not not lots like like three or four um but um but uh, but they're all written from a very like clinical perspective and then and then from someone that uh, from the perspective of like someone like me um and and I just kind of um like slogged through all the emotions um like, like I read I, I read Dessa Weiss's book on on cluttering and um, and, and he wrote a lot of really accurate stuff, but it was really, really hard to stomach. Um, and, um, and 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 still, like, uh, w- w- well, I think in the last month, there, um, there there were two times when I like read something, and it it just like hit me so hard um, that um, just just kind of the the clinical like um, like 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 disjointed nature of it that uh, that I said, oh well, this is kind of depressing. 
I need to take a couple of days break from thinking about this. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so, uh, so, so anyway, it's um, I, I'm probably being a little bit over dramatic uh, now, but no, not at all. Uh, but, but it's just really, really cool that uh, like like your approach and uh, your uh, your approach and like like kind of a kinder, gentler approach than a uh, well than than that you're describing. So, so how did you? How did you come up with that? Like, how um, how did you how did you develop develop that? Because I'm I'm pretty sure at one point you were um, kind um, kind of part of this um, part of this cold hard technically accurate um, system that um, and it, um, and then you became like oh well hey these are people too um, so, um, so 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 what was kind of the process with you in 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 realizing that and being so passionate about the human element of of stuttering and cluttering? Yeah, that's a really good question. So when I first got out of graduate school, um, I'll be honest, I was really into data because my graduate coursework, while it was very, very strong, it, it was also really into data. And so um, that's what I did. But um, my first person who stutters that I served was an adult who um, I'll never forget this man. And he, he had been through the ringer with therapy. He was in his forties. He had children and a wife and he was trying to go back to college because he wanted to do something different with his life. And he came into my clinic and I had just got my C's, which is um, the certificate of clinical competence. I just got fully certified. Like I was, I was like 25 and fresh off the press, <laughs> like just just, just certified and ready to go <laughs> by myself. And here walks this guy who, who stutters pretty prominently. And, um, and he, he comes in for the eval, very pleasant man, but I'll never forget. He says, I've done delayed auditory feedback. I've traveled to other states for very expensive, intensive programs. He says, I've done this, I've done that, I've done, he names all these things. He knows all the strategies by name. He knows everything. And he says, what's gonna make you different? <laughs> and I'm brand new. And I thought, oh, holy bleep, de bleep, bleep, <laughs> is what I thought in my head. And I told him, I said, I said, well, you know what's going to make me different? I said, I just got my certification about two weeks ago. <laughs> I said, so I don't have years of experience to offer you. I said, but what I have to offer offer you is a fresh mind i'm new on the research and i'm gonna put so much work into you and learning you and what you want and what you need that's what i can offer you and we'll learn together that's what will make me different and i ended up having him on caseload for a year and he's one of the best experiences i've ever had i'll never forget him and we did great together. And I guess he liked my answer because <laughs> it was honest. Um, and that's when I started learning um, from him that um, it wasn't just data. And, um, and then even going further, I started learning, wow, everybody has different opinions on this stuff because the next person had a different experience from him and he really hated the phone and the radio and all this stuff. And the next person didn't really mind the phone. Right. And so, and what, what helped my first guy didn't really help this other guy. Right. And so I started to learn, wow. And in, in terms I used with this guy, this other guy didn't like so much. And, and, and he taught me that. And, but really, I don't feel like I could effectively treat people who stutter 
and I'll even venture to say clutter, but I've only treated one um, until I started to immerse myself in the community and listen and really, really listen and appreciate um, their stories and their experiences and humbly attempt to put myself in their shoes, knowing that I could times their experiences by a hundred and still not know what it's like, right? So learn to have a little bit of a humbling respect for what they've gone through. Um, but then also learning that, and, and this is kind of my quote that I use in my students, and it's kind of the idea around the textbook I'm writing, um, and I'm writing a stuttering textbook and I have a co-author too, it's pretty cool. Um, what does a sick person who's getting sicker do? Write a textbook, because that's a good idea. Um, so much work, but it's worth it. Um, I always say it's your stutter, not mine. And I always say it's their stutter, not yours, even if the clinician stutters. Because everybody has a different story. And so even though I now stutter, I don't even claim to know what it's like to grow up as a person who stutters. And my story is not even close to the person sitting in front of me. I can share what I've experienced since July, but that's what I can offer to them and they can take it or leave it or like my story or not, but it doesn't matter what I think about stuttering. It doesn't matter if I like this treatment method or not. What matters is the person sitting in front of me who I'm treating for therapy and what they think about their stuttering journey. That's what I'm treating. I'm not treating mine. I'm treating theirs. And my job in that moment is to use my education to provide a template. I provide the template, but they hold the keys and they steer. I, I use the, the, the analogy of a ship in my class and, and I'm the ship and they're the steering wheel of the therapeutic relationship and they steer where therapy goes and I use my clinical expertise to write the goals. The person, the person who stutters doesn't write the goals, I have to write them, but they control what they are and I control what they say. And we have a mutual relationship because I have to target them, right? But it all revolves around the person who stutters because that's how it should be. They are the ones whose lives we're treating, just like in physical therapy, right? When I go to physical therapy, the first thing the physical therapy therapist asks me, which I've been in PT, I just got dismissed. What, what? Got off my walker. What, what? The first thing they asked me was, what's your goal? And I said, well, I don't want to be on this walker forever. And I said, okay, that's what we worked on. Why would stuttering therapy be no different? We're working on this person's life goals, not the clinicians, but theirs. Why would it be any different? So I had this transition in my mind because I had this realization of, wait a minute, right? When I first became a speech pathologist, I used to think that I had to save people who stuttered and cluttered, right? I used to think I had to put on this cape, right? And like Wonder Woman style, save y'all, right? I thought that y'all needed saving and helping. And really, I couldn't have been more wrong. And it was quite humbling the other way around. People who stutter ended up saving me. So I learned quite the lesson. Well, that's, um, that's a really cool story and a really... Um, and a really cool perspective on, um, especially from, um, especially like the correlation to uh, physical therapy and, and a really good physical therapist um, 
makes it all about your goals. So, so it totally makes sense that a really good speech therapist um, or, or, or what, uh, what, uh, whatever the right word for speech therapist is, uh, would make it all about the, um, the person's goals um, too. Yeah. So, um, so, so another question I have, um, and I think, I think that a lot of people have it because um, I think everyone, um, everyone's kind of casually run into a couple people or, or at least a few people in their life who stutter, and I think, um, it, it, and, and this is uh, this is a really fascinating question for me. So uh, I, I've asked it to like a few different people, but um, but 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 I think it's a really important question. Is that if if somebody uh, if somebody has a friend who stutters, then what should they do? And and, and like um, both, what, what should they, what, what should they do? What should they not, should they not do? Should they talk to the person? Should they not t talk to the person? Should they um, should they should they help the person out? Should they not help the person out? Just um, like I think, and and um, and and I remember um, I remember one um, I remember back back when I was first like getting uh, like learning about cluttering and talking about cluttering. Then then one of my one of my friends said, "Oh hey hey I have this coworker who 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 stutters." And um, and then and then they just barraged me with a whole bunch of questions, which which at the time I didn't really know anything about stuttering, so so I didn't really have any answer. Uh, but 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 I think that's something that happens a lot because um, because the experience of stuttering isn't something that most people can like directly relate to, and so um, and so so I think people just have the question, well, what uh, what, what should I do? What should I not do? Um, I I I can. I can see, I can hear that this person's uh, like, like going through whatever they're going through, and I don't really know what to do. So, 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 what, what, uh, what should I do? That's a really good question. And as a friend, that just shows that you really, really care. Um, and so, that's very, very much appreciated. Um, very, very much appreciated. And really, you know. There are some, you know, generalized listener tips that you can find online, um, you know, don't interrupt, don't, you know, but um, every person who stutters is different. It's so individualized that the best thing to do is just ask the person who stutters. And especially if you're their friend, you can ask them, what do you prefer? Um, some people who stutter don't like the word fluency. Some people who stutter don't even like the word stutter. That's less common, but it does exist. Um, and so really as a friend, you can ask, hey, does it really, really bother you to get interrupted? And a lot of people who stutter don't like getting interrupted. In fact, that's a general listener tip that we use to educate the general public is don't interrupt someone who stutters, let them finish what they want to say, right? Um, you know, some people who stutter may not mind if a friend interrupts them, right? Or they may really mind if a friend interrupts them, right? Um, and so the best thing to do is ask the person who stutters specifically things they like and things they don't like, just and, like uh, would ask so, anybody else. And, and I think um, I think that's I think that's something that people are really like uh, they, um, they don't really know how to do that, like um, like. Like, like what's um, what's the way um, what, what's the way to ask someone like like probably in a big group isn't um, isn't isn't the right way and no. um, and um, and then like like probably most people don't really have a good vocabulary about um, about about speech and language to be able to like say the um, um, say the right words and, and actually asking about it um, and um, and and I know like like when people have asked me about cluttering, they 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 just usually use like weird weird language that like like if I it, um, if I had like sensitivities about stuff like that, I might um, I I might get really really mad when they uh, when they tried to ask. But then uh, um, but, but but anyway, like like if you have a 
uh, uh, what's um, what's what's the way to initiate that, and how would you? Uh, uh, and and, and uh, 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 maybe you could like role play a little bit about like like how to um, how to um, how to be a friend, like talking to um, someone with stuttering the first time. Yeah, that's a really good thing. So, so yeah, so, so generally I would say, of course, I always let somebody finish what they're going to say, um, but definitely approach this situation one-on-one. -on -one. Don't do it in a group because um, that definitely could be embarrassing or make the person feel bad. Um, but I would definitely say something like, you know, hey, you know, can I talk to you about something? And if you have a good relationship with that person to where you guys can just talk about things. Um, I would just say something along the lines of, hey, I just want to make sure that I, um, I've talked to people and I've said, hey, I just want to make sure that I get this right when I'm speaking to you and make you comfortable as possible. Um, do you, um, you know, when you're speaking with someone, do you absolutely hate being interrupted? You know, is that something you don't like? You know, okay. So just kind of, or you could even introduce the situation to say, you know, hey, I have some questions about um, when you're communicating with somebody or when we are communicating, you could say, I have some questions about when we're communicating, um, do you mind? I want to and, make sure that I'm on the right track. And would you uh, would you would you recommend not not using the word stutter or stuttering or um, like uh, like like uh, would, would it sometimes be awkward if 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 someone said, "Hey, I noticed that you stutter," or "I noticed that you have a stuttering problem," or uh, like like there's probably like lots and lots of different phrases that um, go go through people's heads and they don't know yeah. really what. You, you can, you know, I would do it one-on-one -on -one and you can use the word, but then you could say, you know, would it, would it bother you if I asked you some questions about your stuttering? You know, you could introduce it like that. Would it bother you if I asked you some questions about your stuttering? Do you mind? You know, and the person may say, you know, yeah, it would bother me or no, now's not a good time or sure, I, I don't mind, right? Um, and if they don't mind, then one of the first questions is, you know, does, you know, is it okay if I even use the word stuttering, <laughs> right? Like, do you prefer a different word? Do you like that word, right? Um, you know, and that's something that I teach my students is that some, you know, words can be triggering for people. And, you know, even when we work with young children, I usually let the child na name their own stuttering. <laughs> if their parent hasn't already named it stuttering for them, I say, you know, that stuff, you know, if they're able to tell me what their speech is doing and they're comfortable talking about that, I'll say, what do you want to call it? You know? Um, but anyways, you know, you could, you could say, you know, do you mind if I ask you some questions about it, you know? Um, and, and if they do mind, then, then say, okay, you know? Um, and if they don't mind, then, you know, you could say, you know, do you prefer it to be called something else? What do you, what do you like to call it? You know, and if they say stuttering's okay, then, then you could say, okay, then, um, and then you can ask some questions like, you know, does it bother you when people interrupt you? Would you rather be able to finish what you want to say? You know, like my best friend stutters, for example, um, from college. And, and that's one of the first questions I asked him, you know, we were one-on-one -on -one and I said, Hey, do you mind if I ask you a few questions about, um, about your stuttering? And he said, no, I don't mind. And I said, okay. And I said, um, I said, so-and-so, I said, when we're out to a restaurant and when we're out and stuff, um, do you want me to um, ever help you when you're communicating um, and in a block and, and such, or do you want me to let you finish? And he said, um, I want you to let me finish. And I said, okay. And that was my question is because um, I didn't know if he, um, would feel relief if I ever helped him finish 
or if he would feel embarrassment if I ever helped him finish. Um, every so often you'll meet somebody who feels relief when their friend helps them finish. Um, but he wanted to be able to finish. So every time we're out, he initiates and says, uh, table for four, the name is this, and, and he does it all himself. It doesn't bother me any. I mean, in fact, I don't even notice his stutter anymore because I've been friends with him for years and it doesn't, you know, but um, those are things that I, those are questions I asked from the get go because I wanted to know his preferences and I wanted to make sure that I did not step on his toes or hurt his feelings or things like that. Um, and so I would just, you know, one-on-one -on -one, um, ask, are you okay to, to talk about this? And, and if they're not ready to talk about it or don't want to, then okay. But if they are, then you can ask some questions just to make communication um, more comfortable uh, for them too and for you, but also they may really appreciate you asking those questions. I know my friend did because he was like, hey, thanks. Thanks for just not assuming like everybody else does. <laughs> I was like, hey, no problem, you know. Yeah, um, um, that's really uh, that's really cool, and that's a um, that's a really good example of, of a, like like an example of conversation. Um, your your real conversation with your um, with your friend. So mm -hmm. so another um, another question. Uh, th uh, this might be my last question, but you uh, you mentioned that you went to stuttering groups, uh, like stuttering support groups, even before you started um, stuttering, and and you mentioned like some um, some connection with. Um, with, with with lung um, lung support groups, um, can, can, um, can you talk about that and like why um, why you why you went to stuttering support groups when you um, didn't have stuttering? I can, yeah. Um, thanks for asking. So um, I um, just love um, stuttering support groups, and I did become an NSA support group leader. Um, my support group is on hold right now for medical reasons, and I hope to get it back and going at some point. But um, I really, really felt like, or feel like I found myself through stuttering support groups, even though I didn't stutter. Um, and that may sound odd, but, um, when I first was diagnosed with this lung disease and this condition, um, I tried to join lung support groups. And um, first off, everybody was older than me, and I'm okay with that. I don't have issues with that. Um, some of them were like double my age and that's okay. That's cool. I love, you know, I've worked a lot of geriatric, <laughs> you know, settings. I'm cool with that. I love, I love that age population and, and that's okay. Um, the problem I had was, um, when I, um, when I joined these support groups, um, the questions I was getting was, um, what are your pulmonary numbers? And I would, I would tell them. And oftentimes, even when I was first diagnosed, my numbers were worse than theirs. And so I was getting a lot of feedback like, oh, I feel so sorry for you. Or, oh, do you have young children? I feel so bad for you. Um, and it was the most morbid feeling I've ever had. And I was just diagnosed. So I was scared and it was not a good feeling. I, I didn't want to join a support group to talk about how fast I'm dying or to talk about how sorry people feel for me because I have a family and I'm in my, I was in my early thirties then. And I had a, you know, career, you know, I had all these things to do and people were like, I'm so sorry, you know, never smoked all these things. And 
I, I didn't want people to tell me, I feel sorry for you. I wanted people to tell me, you can do this. You can live your life. You can, you know, it's going to be okay. And that's not what I was getting. I was getting, what are your numbers? Well, that sucks <laughs> basically, you know? Um, and so I, I quit very quickly. <laughs> like I did not last very long. I lasted like three days. Um, it was this online support group and I was left very kind of traumatized <laughs> from that experience. I'm sure they meant well, but that didn't work out very well. Um, and I actually found myself in stuttering support groups. Um, stuttering support groups taught me how to live and I didn't stutter then. Um, and it's interesting because um, I was accepted. I was, you know, I had people tell me you're one of us and it was so, so honoring because um, I was taught how to keep going. Nobody asked me my pulmonary numbers <laughs> at all. Nobody said, I feel sorry for you. Nobody wanted to talk about how fast I was dying. Nobody wanted to talk about what stage I was in of this progression. I got none of that. And what was even better is they accepted me despite that I didn't stutter and it was be it was the most beautiful thing. I don't claim to I don't claim to know what it's like to grow up stuttering. I don't. But I will say that people who stutter understand me and they get me and I can confide in confide in people who stutter um, pretty much all or most of my best friends stutter. <laughs> y'all they understand me and there's something to say about the parallels um with stuttering and lung disease I, I'll, I'll say and again I don't claim to know what it's like to grow up to stutter but um you know when it is something that is supposed to come automatic like speaking that is affected versus something that is supposed to come automatic like breathing that is affected there are some commonalities there and when we speak to each other we have some things in common that we talk about and it's it's really interesting um and and we've connected in ways that are really beautiful and um yeah the the stuttering community literally has saved me so um it's pretty cool well that's uh that's a really really uh, that's a really really cool story and and i've um, i've never been to a stuttering um support group but but the way you're describing it makes it sound like just really cool welcoming and um inviting so that's um uh, that's awesome yeah, yeah, it's pretty neat. So, so I think we're um, I think we're about out of time. But I wanted to thank you so much for um, for, um, for 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 being on here. Um, before uh, before we wrap up, is there anything um, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that we didn't um, cover? Not really. No, this was an honor, and I'm just so thankful to be interviewed and be on your show. This was really great. Cool and and um, and thank you um, thank you so much for everything that you've talked about it's um, it's been really really fascinating and we covered a whole bunch of different um, topics um, top, um, topics that are all just very very interesting to me so um, so 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 it's just really cool that, um, and and just um, great um, great listening to you and thanks for um, thanks for basically teaching me all of the um, all of the just interesting things about about pretty much everything that we've talked about so thank you so much. You're welcome, anytime.